Well, this ought to be interesting. What time is it? All right. I wonder how much time God wants. How much time do you think God wants today? How much, when do you want to stop? <laughs> Joel. How about 11? We'll go 11.45. We're stopping at 11.45. Not p.m., though. That's 12 hours and 45 minutes. Hmm. Let's change that to a.m. All right, when this goes off, I'm praying. 40 minutes, it says. Yesterday... Uh, I was praying about this, and for some reason I come in here when I pray, when, when I'm in my office, which is weird, because this is just sticks and mortar and glass, and it's pretty and everything, but God's not any more in here than He is in my office, than He is in my bathroom at home. So I can pray anywhere, but when I'm in the church, for some reason I come in here to pray, I think because it's beautiful and quiet, and, and uh, the ambiance of the room makes me feel more connected with the Lord, so... I was talking to him about my message because I had a lot of work to do, and it was my anniversary yesterday. And, uh, and the Lord said, uh, and there were some other things involved too that I was wrestling with, some things that led up to this. And the Lord said, when are you going to stop trying so hard? And uh, you know, last week uh, we had a missionary speaker, um, John Ingalls was here, and he said, the Lord's Spirit spoke to my spirit. And I like that. I don't know that that's in the scriptures, maybe it is, but I like that analogy or, or description of what happens. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit of God seems to speak to our spirit. You know, it's not an audible voice. Uh, I didn't have a vision. It just feels like that's what God said to me. And, um, and that's really tough because sometimes uh, that's just our own weird, deceitful heart, right? So I'm kind of like, all right, I don't know. Was that God speaking to me? He says, when are you going to try stop trying so hard? He said... And, and I felt like, you know, I studied all week and I knew what we were going to talk about. And I felt like God said, you know, just stop with all the stuff, all the PowerPoint and the stories and the, you're trying so hard and my word is enough. My word is enough. Just share God's word and, and, and just trust me and, and go home and be with your wife. And I'm like, I, I stood right there. And I didn't know which cross to yell at. I talked to that one and that one. And I said, this is a terrible idea. And God didn't say anything. And I said, really, this is a terrible idea. And I said it a dozen more times. And he said, just do what I'm telling you to do. Okay. So here we go. With very little preparation, I have a list of scriptures we're going to read together. We're going to use Bibles today. Uh, and I'm calling this Unplugged which is kind of neat because, um, and I'm still plugged in, but it's kind of neat that music we sang was I, 23 years ago we sang that in Bible college, uh, and so a little bit older, it felt like delivered garage days. I don't know if they still use that term or not, but like when I was a kid, if a rock band came out with something from 20 years ago that they did in their garage, they'd put out an al album and they would have all these songs, and they'd call it Garage Days, and they'd sell a ton of them, because this was back in the day before anybody knew who we were. So that was like delivered Garage Days from a few years ago, so that was kind of cool. So um, I don't care what version of the Bible you use. You have these in your pews, and then you probably have that on your phone. If you don't have that on your phone and you have a smartphone, you should get that on your phone. Um, but I do want to make sure everybody has a Bible, because today all you're getting is this. You're not getting anything on the screen. And so if you need a Bible, um, find one. Now, in your pews, you have these, which it's funny because these ones are like so small, no one can read them. And so I said to uh, my wife when she was still uh, secretary, I said, can you get some with bigger print? And these you could read from the moon. So it's kind of funny to go from one extreme to the other. But let me say this. These are all over the church. And there's two different copies of this, and then there's some of these. I, I'm going to make sure we have Bibles here. I was a little embarrassed last week when John asked us to read something, and I knew that half the church didn't have a Bible, and I didn't even have a Bible. 
And I was like, I know I have a Bible on my phone, but my phone was in my office, and I don't know how many people came prepared to read something. And so I just want to make sure we have Bibles in our chairs. So I'm going to order some more. But I want to tell you that I purposely order these cheap Bibles. Uh, I don't want to order those really nice hardcover Bibles because if you ever come to this church and you need a Bible, I just want you to take one. In fact, I just want you to give them away. Like, that's my thought. Like, if you know somebody and you're like, man, I've been talking to them about Jesus for a while and you, you just want to give them a Bible, just take one. Like, even if you don't know anyone to give one to but you think that's kind of a neat idea, just take one. Like, take five. I don't care. They cost like $2 a piece. And so just give them away to people and we'll just keep ordering more Bibles. So I'm never going to order those really nice, expensive pew Bibles. We're just going to keep ordering these cheap ones. And I hope that you just keep giving them away and we have to just keep ordering them. So um, I do want to figure this out, though, because there's these little like racks underneath the chairs. And I want to figure out how many I actually have to order. How many of you use this? Can Just show of hands. Okay, so maybe a third Everybody being honest? Okay, raise up your hands really high if you use this. Well, maybe half. Okay. And how many of you are still like, we're doing this? We're bringing this. We're, if we're going to use our Bibles, we're doing this. Raise your hands. So the other half. All right. Very good. And if you didn't raise your hand, then you don't have a Bible and you should take one. So very good. If you don't have a copy of God's Word right now, I want to make sure you have one. And so I don't know how to do that without embarrassing you, but can you guys just kind of, maybe if you need a Bible, can you raise your hand, tell me if you need one? This, he needs a Bible. Do we have one in that pew or right around him somewhere that we can give him one? Do we have an extra one? Did everybody scoop him up already? I can go get more. Oh, he's got one. Anybody else need a Bible? We're good. Okay, everybody's got a Bible. Good, sweet. Here we go. Last time we did 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 7. So find, find, sorry, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 7. I didn't go completely unplugged, probably because I don't trust God uh, enough. Um, but I was so convinced I would make mistakes and say them wrong that I thought, well, at least if they're up here, you can find the passage, even if I totally mess it up. So today I will take credit for all of the mistakes and, and God's word will stand on its own and hopefully be enough to challenge our hearts and turn our hearts um, more towards him. So 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 7, I'm going to read that as soon as I find it. Rome, core, core. So right after Romans. So it's the first four Gospels and then Romans. Oh, and then Acts. First four Gospels, then Acts, then Romans, then Corinthians. So in these big blue Bibles, I'm on page 1,204. The light of the Gospel Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That whole thing is about the message of the gospel. And then he talks about that message of the gospel and his, also his apostolic ministry about this treasure. He says in verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay. He's talking about his body and his brokenness to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So that was the message that we talked about two weeks ago. We were in in that chunk of Scripture, and we talked about five principles of evangelism from that text. We talked about taking courage because of the mercy of God. We deserve judgment, but instead of judgment, God had mercy on us, and He gave us this ministry of the gospel. That's God's mercy, and we should have courage in that 
because we should see that God wants to accomplish this task through us. So that should give us courage when we preach the gospel. And then we talked about speaking the truth. That was verse 2. Um, he says, and remember in all of this, he's trying to encourage the Corinthian church because he just, in 1 Corinthians, he wrote this letter and he just railed on them about following these false teachers who are just like entertaining them and preaching all about their uh, credentials and taking their money. And, and so, you know, these guys would be the kind of preachers that would say, God wants your money and here's my address, send it to me. So he railed them in 1 Corinthians about following these false teachers. And then, in, and then he, he said, this is what an apostolic ministry should look like. And 2 Corinthians, he's, he's writing more of a love letter to them to patch things up with them, and he's, and he's still um, justifying his apostolic ministry, and he's, he's justifying it by saying, look, this is what a minister of the gospel should look like. And so in that first chunk of Scripture, we talked about these five principles that Paul never violates. He says these are things that are like core truths for the evangelist, and he says take courage because of the mercy of God. He says, speak the truth. Don't, don't try to sugarcoat it and lie to people. He says, the gospel's a stumbling block. People are going to struggle with it. Just tell people in grace the truth. Expect blindness. He goes on to say there's some people in this world that are blind. He says, some are not going to believe. And so expect that. Don't be discouraged when you share the gospel with somebody and they go, no, thank you, not interested. That's going to happen. Just plan on that. Even Paul had that experience. Then he says, proclaim Christ. Uh, remember that the power of God is not found in you, it's found in Jesus. And so if you proclaim Christ, they're going to see the glory of God in you. They're going to see the glory of God in Jesus that's in you. And so stop preaching with this um, flowery, delivered message. He says, preach Jesus and they will come in contact with the glory of God. And, and remember, and I shared this with our prayer meeting group, Remember that it was Jesus that brought you to faith. That miracle that happened in you was because you came in contact with Christ, not because you came in contact with some person. And so preach Christ because that same miracle that happened in you has to happen in them. And so make sure you're preaching Jesus to them. And then the last one is this verse 7. Remember, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Remember honest humility. Remember, you're a broken person and that's part of God's plan. Now, he takes off on that in the next six, seven verses, and he talks about the brokenness and God's plan to use broken people <clears throat> to accomplish this mission. And so that's kind of what I want to look at today. I want to look at the next few verses. In fact, I'm going to read verses 7 to 12, and then we're going to talk about those verses for a few minutes. So keep staying in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to pick back up at 7, so I'm going to read 7 again. We'll read through 12. <clears throat> we have this treasure, the gospel, in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Okay, perplexed, church. How many times have we said as a church family, we do not know what to do to reach this community? And we pray for ideas of how we're going to reach this community. Like, what can we do to try to get people to listen to our message, the gospel? That word perplexed, we just kind of look at the community and go, Lord, tell us what to do. I don't know what to do. We, we, we're trying everything we can think of. Tell us how to preach the gospel. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. We refuse to give up. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Okay, those two verses, we're carrying around the death of Jesus in our bodies. We're being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the glory of Jesus, the life of Jesus, or the resurrection of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Think about the passage of Scripture we read today in the worship time. Philippians 2, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, talks about having the same attitude in you that is also in Jesus 
And it talks about how he laid down his rights to rescue us. So he laid down his throne. He laid down his glory. He left heaven. I know he still was the glory of God, but I mean, you came in contact with Jesus. You didn't start glowing like Moses did. So he laid down some of his authority and he, he was completely submissive to God and what God wanted to do. He only spoke the words that God told him to speak. He became a human. He went all the way to the cross. He laid down his life and died on our behalf. He died. He gave up everything and sacrificed everything to rescue us. Philippians, that passage that we read during the worship time, tells us that we're supposed to have the same attitude in us. So there should be some sacrifice in the Christian life. If you look at your life and there is no sacrifice for the sake of the gospel, you're missing the boat. There's something missing. If there's no laying down of your rights for the sake of the gospel, and I, and I can't preach a black and white sermon and say, this is how it should look for you and this is how it should look for you because this is how it looks for me. I don't know what that looks like for you, especially since I don't know what you struggle with. I mean, for Paul, right, part of Paul's problem was he was arrogant. I probably take some flack for that when I get to heaven. Paul was an arrogant guy. I mean, how many times he says, well, I shouldn't probably talk about this, but, you know, I am this, and I am this, and I am this, and I don't want to brag on myself, but these are my credentials. God gave him all kinds of physical afflictions, and he, he probably wasn't an amazing preacher. People fell asleep while he was preaching. They fell out of windows and died, Right? So God gives him this humility and he has these sacrifices that he has to deal with and make because God's going to keep him humble so he's dependent on God's power. There's sacrifice. Maybe it's financial sacrifice. Maybe it's physical sacrifice. Maybe it's sacrifice of your time. I have no idea what it should look like for you, but if there is no sacrifice in your life for the sake of the gospel, there's a problem. If that's not on your mind, there's a problem with your Christianity. I'll leave it at that. We who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. As we die to self and we lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel, life and miraculous things happen in other people. Okay. I want to show you this idea. This is how I thought before I studied this week, God sometimes works through weakness. And so when I'm weak, God has the opportunity to work through me to make much of his glory. And then I read a bunch of commentaries on this text. And I listened to a couple sermons on this text, and everybody said the same thing. Now I'm just going to tell you, I don't completely have a handle on it yet. But the way they talk about this text, they said... It's as if Paul, the language that he uses and the way it's written, is actually saying this. God only works through weakness. Only. Like, when you are strong, when you are doing things in your strength, God is silent. God chooses not to work through that. I, I don't have a handle on all of that yet, but it kind of made my head blow up. Like, okay, how many times am I doing ministry the way that's comfortable for me, the way that I feel strong in it? Quick example, all right? I could go be a contractor and never depend on God. Like, I think that's why God moved me out of the trades and into ministry, because I could do that blindfolded. And I wouldn't do it all perfectly, but I would never, ever wake up in the morning and wonder, what if I don't know what to do today? I wouldn't. I would never even think that. I, I, would probably ne I could preach every Sunday on how to do projects and never prepare a message. Like, I'd just get up here and tell you how to do it. I just have complete confidence in my strength. But you ask me to stand up here without any notes... Like last night, I begged God to just let me fall asleep without obsessing over it. Like, God, I don't, I, this is a terrible idea. And God's like, you just need to trust me. You just need to trust that I'm going to tell you what to say. So this idea blows up my head because I'm like, how many times am I, am I really just manipulating situations so that I can feel strong and comfortable? And what if 
God shows up when I choose to be weak. And, and I know that that is gray for everybody. That might look different for everybody. I, I don't know. I, and maybe, it, maybe this isn't it. Maybe this is a, a too dogmatic, a, too extreme of a statement. But I, I, I kind of feel like if, if the preachers who are smarter than me and the, and the commentaries who are smarter than me all kind of said this is what Paul is trying to say here, maybe it's right. Okay, so we'll just file that away and let the Holy Spirit of God work on your heart with that. But I want to show you two passages in the same chapter that are really important for this message Paul's preaching to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4.1. So just go back to the first verse. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Now go to verse 16. So we do not lose heart. That to me says two things. First of all, ministry can be very discouraging and make me want to quit. When I make this much sacrifice and nothing happens, I could really want to just throw my hands up and say, it doesn't work. These people aren't interested. I'm done. I'm going to go do something else. And the other thing is, you look at Paul's life, and of all the people who had reason to lose heart, after everything he experienced, he says, we do not quit. We do not lose heart. We look at what God is doing, and we say, we will continue. I think that's really kind of an exciting idea. All right. Now, I have no, okay, we got, we got time. We're going to go to Acts for a little bit. So flip over to Acts chapter 9. I want to talk about Paul's life, and I want to just flip through the book of Acts for a little bit, and look at what Paul experienced. I stole these verses from Alistair Begg. He didn't, he didn't write them, so I figured he was okay with me using them. Um, and so th this is part of his outline from his sermon. So if you want to hear a better sermon on it, just go listen to his sermon. It's awesome. Acts 9, 10 through 19. I'm on page 1145 in the Blue Bible. The numbers are so small. Okay, verse 10. There was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. I'm going to keep reading. And he has seen a vision, and a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, this is a bad idea. Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done in your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I just want to show in that short... Okay, so it's 10 through 19. So God... Thanks for helping me keep going. Uh, I just want to show that Ananias went to do something that he was extremely uncomfortable with. God's Spirit spoke to his spirit somehow. Maybe it was a vision. Maybe he actually saw it. I don't, know. I don't know. But God said, go do this. And Ananias was like, no, I don't want to go do this. How many people can you think of in the Scriptures that looked to God and said, I don't... Can you pick someone else? Moses, think of that. Like... You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not the guy. No, you're the guy. And Ananias is like, this guy kills people. No, I don't want to go. And God says, just trust me. I want you to go. Guys, ministry is uncomfortable. Preaching the gospel is going to be uncomfortable. It doesn't matter how many times you do it. Maybe the more you experience rejection, the more okay you'll be with it. But it's never going to be comfortable when God says, go do this. You're always going to be like, I mean... How much faith does it take for me to tell you how to roof a house? Zero. Zero faith. I can do that blindfolded and half asleep. 
how much faith does it take for me to stand up here and share truth with you? I'm terrified to do that. After 12 years, still scared. Hate doing it. Like, at the end of me telling God this was a bad idea for 10 minutes, I said, well, God, at least maybe they'll fire me and I can go do what I like. Like, I don't like to do this. Ananias is in the same boat with us. I don't really want to go stand at City Fest and meet with people that I've never met and, and put myself out there to try to remember these scriptures and try to share the gospel with them. Yeah, I know they raised their hand, but I'm just not comfortable with that. It's never going to be comfortable. And then, just catch this, um, in verse 16 he says, I will show him, meaning Paul, how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I don't think that was just Paul's uh, cross to bear. In fact, what does Jesus say about carrying the cross? Somebody's got it. Take up your cross. Follow me. Jesus says every one of us has a cross to bear. And every one of us has a cross that looks different than somebody else's cross. Just because you have it a certain way or experience a certain thing doesn't mean that the person sitting next to you is going to experience the same thing or going to sacrifice in the same way. But every one of us has a cross to carry. Ananias had a cross to carry. Paul has a cross to carry, and his was extremely painful. And he says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying hands on him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell off of his eyes and he regained his sight and then he rose and was baptized and taking food he was strengthened. Wow. Ananias trusts God. And he gets to do something miraculous. And he's part of one of the greatest evangelistic stories of all time. Paul coming to Christ and following Christ. Acts 14. To go over a couple pages. I'm on page 1,152 in the Blue Bible. Oh, they're all blue. That doesn't work. Uh, good. You'll figure it out. Acts 14. Oh, we're going to read 1 through 11. I want you to know that right now, I have no idea what that says. I have no idea what it says. All right, let's see what God has for us. Now at Iconium, I read it yesterday, but I'm so dumb I cannot remember it. At Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord. This is Paul preaching the gospel at Iconium. Paul and Barnabas. They, they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his, of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. And some sided with the Jews, and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made on both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it, and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia. Can you imagine being in a city, preaching, open-air preaching, and, and the crowds are gathering, hundreds of people, and half of them are all in wanting to hear the gospel that you're preaching, and the other half of them are trying to figure out how they can stone you to death. This is what they're facing. So they figure out that they're going to get killed, and they flee to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and they continued to preach the gospel. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet, and he was crippled from birth, and had never walked, and he listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to become well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down, so they want to worship them. The, the crowds start to worship Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, 
because he was the chief speaker and the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought in oxen and garlands. They want to offer sacrifices. So Paul and Barnabas say, hold on, don't do that. And, and actually they tore their clothes because that was kind of like a Jewish way of saying blasphemy. So they show the Jews that this is blasphemy. We're not gods. Don't worship us. Don't offer sacrifices to us. And then jump to verse 19. Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city supposing that he was dead. Okay, so we're at um, Joel's house fixing a fence. Great story now. And I got a pair of these channel locks in my hand, so they're the adjustable players. And at the top of the fence, and I'm standing on a hill, and those guys are on the other side of the fence, and you lift up the fence to the top bar, and then you wrap a wire around the pole, and you twist it around, and it holds the fence up. The fence is sagging, and so I got these channel locks on the wire, and they're lifting up on the fence, and I'm pulling on that wire as hard as I can on the channel locks, and it slips off the wire, and I hit myself square in the forehead. As, I mean, it looked like I just went whack with these channel locks, right? And immediately you see the flash of white, you know, and you're like, whoa, and I just kind of went like this, and my head just went, and I mean, holy cow, that hurt like crazy. And, and I don't usually, I'm not an ice guy, but I think Missy said, do you want some ice? And I'm like, yes, definitely need ice. I thought I'd crack my skull. Imagine if a crowd of people picked up rocks and threw them at your face as hard as they could over and over and over trying to kill you until you are so maimed and unconscious that they think you're dead and they drag your body out of the city. That would hurt. You're talking lots of contusions Lots of ice needed in that situation. Lots of problems. Look at what Paul does. Look at verses 20 to 22. I'll find 20. When the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and he entered the city. He went back into the city. He wakes up. He stands up. And he says, I'm good. Let's go. Whoa, whoa, Paul. They just tried to stone you to death. We're pretty sure it's a miracle you're able, even able to stand. Let's take a day off. Let's go to another city. Let's leave this place. He stands up and he goes back into the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. So he goes back in to preach and to make sure that the disciples there were settled. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. So they go on to Derby and they preach there, and then they come back to Lystra and Iconium to strengthen the souls of the people they had led to Christ encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Do you know why he says through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God? Because his face is so swollen that he probably can't see out of one of his eyes. I mean, he's got to be black and blue and, and the disciples there have to be like, what the world? And he's like, trust me, this is the cross I have to bear. Through many, many tribulations we help people enter the kingdom of God. If you are a preacher of the gospel, if you're a follower of Christ, you're a preacher of the gospel, there should be something in your life, some kind of tribulation, some kind of cross you're carrying, some kind of sacrifice you're making. Jesus says we all have a cross to bear. We all have something to carry. Acts 16. Jump to 16, we'll go to 14. Oh, I like this little story. So I'll just give you a little background. 
Paul goes um, to the next city. He goes to, well, let me see. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia. So they're in Philippi and they go out to preach. Now they go out in Philippi and they're just preaching the gospel and everybody's kind of listening. But look at what it says about this one person. They're preaching to a lot of people, which means they're probably experiencing a lot of rejection. Look at what it says about this one person. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. Now here's the key part. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. He's out there preaching the gospel to who knows who, And one person, God opens her heart and she hears it and she understands it and she comes in contact with Jesus and the very glory of God and she believes in Christ. How cool is that? How real is that to us who are like, we don't know how to share the gospel with people because nobody wants to hear it. Paul would be like, I know. I know how that feels. I know what it feels like to go out and preach to hundreds of people and nobody wants to hear it. And you don't know who's listening and you don't know whose heart God is opening and God opens this one person's heart so that she can understand. Take a look at verse 19. When the owners saw their hope of gain was gone. Okay, so he goes and keeps preaching and he comes in contact with this fortune teller and she's demon possessed and he gets really annoyed because she won't stop interrupting his sermon. And so he casts out the demon and then the people who are basically own this slave who's this fortune teller, they're making all this money on her. They get mad at Paul because he cast out this demon and he ruined their income stream. And so they get mad at him. In verse 19, it says, When the owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. They dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. And they, ad- they, advocate, they advocate customs that are not lawful to the Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd saw this all happening, joined in and attacking them. And the magistrates, these are supposed to be the judges, tore their garments. So they say heresy, must have been Jewish judges, tore their garments and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received the order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. That is quite the cross to bear. Go to chapter 20. We'll read verse 18. Okay, so Paul travels to Macedonia. And then he comes back to Ephesus. So this is one of his missionary journeys. He gets on a boat. He travels across the sea. He goes to Macedonia. He spends months there preaching. And then he comes back to Ephesus. I don't think he didn't go back. to. In one of the letters to the Corinthians, uh, one of the commentators said he didn't go back to Corinth because he was trying to save the believers there from being persecuted. And so he doesn't go back to Ephesus. It wouldn't have been that far of a journey for him when he gets back. Um, to that area when he gets back to Turkey, it wouldn't have been that far of a journey for him to go north to Ephesus. But I think possibly he was trying to save the believers there from persecution. If Paul shows up, he comes with an entourage, people start listening, and all of a sudden everybody starts trying to persecute these believers. So there's a possibility that he was trying to preserve the church and save the church from lots of persecution. So instead, he calls the elders to come south He wants to say goodbye to them. He's been on this missionary journey for a couple of years and he wants to to leave them with some parting words. And these are the parting words to the elders of the church of Ephesus in verse 18, chapter 20, verse 18. 
When they came to him and they said to him, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit. And here's the important part. He says, I'm constrained to go to Jerusalem. I know I have to go to Jerusalem. The Spirit of God spoke to my spirit said, I want you to go to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except for I know this, except for that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Imprisonment and afflictions await me. Paul knew that was his cross to bear. The Holy Spirit had testified to his spirit that that was his cross to bear. Gabe, I'll end with this story. Gabe, uh, my son decided to roof the house across the street from my house. We bought this house that was on sale for tax sale and we're going to fix it up and I don't know if we're going to sell it or rent it or what, but it's been my wife and I's little hobby project and, my, and I got a couple of roofing quotes, and my son says, Dad, I'll do it. And I said, okay, you can do it. And so we're paying Gabe to do it. And it's been a huge project for him. Uh, he's never roofed a house before. Uh, two, it's a layer of cedar shakes and two layers of shingles, which means a million nails. And, and the day he started tearing off shingles, it started raining every day. We haven't had rain at all this summer, and now it's raining every single day. It's ridiculous. Um, and so the tarp goes on and off the roof like crazy, and he hired some help. Every time I go over there, Gabe says to me, um, Dad, this is really hard. And I, yeah, I know. It is really hard. I've done it. It's very hard. No, Dad, this is, this is really hard. And Gabe's a really tough guy, and he's got a lot of endurance. And so I know he's hurting, uh, and I know he's working really hard because they're making good headway. They got one side all torn off and under paper and half roofed already. And so he's doing a good job. I'm really proud of him. Says, Dad, this is, this is really hard. I'm exhausted at the end of the day. And I keep saying to Gabe over and over, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Everybody. That's why people don't like to roof their own houses. That's why they can charge a fortune to come and roof your house. If it was easy, everybody would do it. And that resonates with this theme that I see in Paul. Like Paul, the, preaching the gospel, carrying my cross. It's kind of hard. Do we have an easier job for me? Like, can you give me something a little easier? And I feel like Paul's like, if it was easy, everybody would just do it. You know, how many, I, I'm trying to encourage you, not discourage you, but how many of us Christians who love the Lord and are so thankful for our salvation want to quietly just hide until we die or Jesus comes back? And that is not the commission. Paul is like, hey, if it was easy, everybody would do it. You're supposed to do it. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be comfortable. I got I to gotta show you one more verse. I just, this blows me away. I have a running list on my computer. Go back to 2 Corinthians for just a minute. I got a running list on my computer of guys that have talked like this in the scriptures. Chapters go fast. Second Corinthians chapter 1, so this is the beginning of the second letter to Corinth. In verse 8, this is what he says to them. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, we prayed that God would kill us because it was that bad. We were so discouraged, we wished for death. That's how hard it got. 
kind of got it pretty easy. I had to stand up here and like, what's the worst thing you're going to do? Throw tomatoes at me or something? Like seriously, my cross is not that hard. What God's asking you to do, whatever it is, I don't know what the Holy Spirit is speaking to your spirit, but whatever it is, it's probably not that hard. And I think it's going to get hard in our country. In fact, I kind of hope it does. But right now, we really have a lot of peace. It's not that complicated. And it's uncomfortable. And it's going to be awkward. And there's going to be some stumbling stones and some crosses to bear and some things you don't like doing. But truly, it's really not that hard. Right? Right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's enough. Amen.